Welcome back to Dairy Public Radio. Reporting from the basement of the Dairy Civic Center, this is Joshua Kahn with the news. On the community calendar, lords and peasants rejoice. King Roland the Good decrees the Dairy Renaissance Fair is this weekend. Bring the family for fun and feast. I recommend getting there early for a hot glass of their famous dragon sand wine. I caution you, if you drink too much, you won't believe the heartburn. You're listening to Dairy Public Radio. This is Dairy Public Radio. Welcome back to Dairy Public Radio, a bi-weekly Stephen King book club podcast. I'm one of your hosts, CM Alexander, alongside Joshua Kahn. Hey, everybody. And Benjamin Graham. Hey, hey, constant readers. And today we are covering part one of The Eyes of the Dragon, that is chapters one through 64, if you're following along, and if not, major spoilers ahead. And Josh is leading our discussion today. Let's get into it. Eyes of the Dragon, a fantasy novel, which... The closest thing I knew of Stephen King writing a fantasy novel was the Dark Tower series. I did not realize there were other fantasy-style novels in his catalog. This is much more straightforward. Uh, Dark Tower is like... I mean, it's fantasy, but it's so weird (laughs) that it's almost... Western romantic. But this is like straight up like fairy tale fantasy. Like Weiss and Hickman? Yeah. See, it, I, I'm glad that you said like, straightforward is a very good way to put it because I was talking to my wife after reading this and I was like, I am really, really enjoying this, but this story is nothing new uh, as far as like the, the broad strokes of the story. Uh, so before we get into it, the the broad strokes of the story, we're, uh, the story takes place in the kingdom of Delane, where King Roland the Good, the king of mediocrity, sits on the throne. <laughs> He has two sons, Peter and Thomas, Peter being the eldest, eldest Thomas being the youngest, and he has a court wizard, and that court magician is Flag, and that's amazing. There are so many super awesome parallels and, like, little bits of familiarity to other stories in this. And to other authors, like H.P. Lovecraft. Where's the Lovecraft? What the Necronomicon. Part? What? His Wait. book is Flag's book, which we'll get to, is the Necronomicon. Yeah. Is it? Does it's it written say by it's Al, the neck? Al has read. Yeah. Has read from H.P. Lovecraft. Oh, so, so I didn't even say catch it's that. The Necrono- Necronomicon, but I, I I did read that name and I was like, I should look up if that's someone <laughs> I should know, and I didn't. So that's awesome. I, I did have a thought that it might be the same book from Revival and. Mm. Uh, Salem's Lot for a second. The, uh, yeah. what's it, what's it called? I can't remember, but that would have been cool too. Yeah, right. The overall story, what we find out very early on with the story, we have another example of in the first chapters, we already know where we're going to end up. And it is that Peter, the king to be, is going to be tried for a terrible crime, found guilty, and be locked away at the top of the needle. So we know, like, in the first few chapters, we know that that is where the story is going. Which I felt was really cool, because the way this story is told is, it it is not written like a novel. It is written in a way that it feels like it is a story being told to us. Like, it is, there is a narrator who is just telling this fairy tale which is very cool i loved it because you get bits of that narrator's opinion Mm -hmm. and like little warnings and hints and at one point he even argues that that thomas the much less loved prince is not really bad even though he does some bad things agree to disagree (laughs) i I don't know if if this is going to be a redemption towards thomas later but for now like he does some pretty fucked up stuff he does, but he's written so humanly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, all the characters are uh, minus Flag, obviously. <laughs> Question about how Flag is written. Okay, so we just came off of uh, five years of The Stand. <laughs> and we're back with Flag immediately, but he does not feel like the Flag we had in The Stand to me in literally any way at all. It, only in that he 
you still get the vibe of how much he loves chaos. Like he's just rock hard for chaos. And I don't think he needs to be the exact same character. No, because because he kind of changes personalities Mm -hmm. a little bit, but I, I couldn't reconcile the two. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I I would agree. He's uh, definitely more quiet and conniving Mm because flag in, the stand is like kind of bombastic and he's like, Hey guys, he's just come a on in. Ball. He's just your fun <laughs> he's uncle a real, flag. He's a real goof. <laughs> uh, but here he's very behind the scenes, mm-hmm. working behind the scenes and doesn't want to be the leader. Um, I mean, he wants to lead, but he doesn't want people to know. He wants to destroy. Yes. And leading is a means to destruction. Yeah. He wants all of the power but none of the focus. Yeah. He, and, and I think that's another thing. He, in this book, unlike the stand, he has time on his side where I felt like with the stand, he knew he also had to rush to, to get things going. And that makes me wonder what happened to him or his magic that he only, that he had to rush. I mean, was that just the way the story played out with the, you know, the good side versus evil or did something happen to him that he's, weaker and he doesn't have as much time he can't take his time well i i let's talk about the stand some more you guys (laughs) the way i see it is you're uh like the way the way you're talking about him is like as though they are literally the same man and i always saw it as like they're the same uh how do i put it they're the same I'm thinking of him as like almost like a reincarnation, but yeah. more direct than that. Yeah, it's it's I I see them more as the same entity, but like twinners almost. He's his own twinner. Yes, yeah. like they they don't have to be the exact same. They don't have the exact same characteristics. They have different modus operandi, but to the same end. Yeah, I guess like one being split apart all realities. Yeah, yeah, I guess. Kind I of. I, I I picture him not quite just you know exactly the same person, but mm. a little more directly that that person, more like a reincarnation. Except it, he's he, it's just him, like he's reborn, like a phoenix. Except he's maybe a little different each time. I fucking love. This is why I love the Dark Tower mythos. <laughs> is that you can say something like. He's the same person, but not. And I'm like, yeah, I get it. <laughs> I know yeah. exactly what you're talking that about. That all tracks. Oh, I'm dying to know what our fans think of, <laughs> of that. That's cool. all right. Uh, well, let's let's talk a little bit about King Roland because at the very beginning, he is where our attention is focused. King Roland, uh, he ascended the throne when the reigning queen choked to death on a lemon because a juggler dropped a crystal ball. <laughs> And that juggler was then immediately beheaded. <laughs> Sorry, just back to what we were talking about for a minute. Our stand flag would have been the reason the juggler dropped the ball. Because <laughs> it's so freaking silly and weird. <laughs> I, I he would like, have been directly responsible for no, that. He would have turned that crystal ball into a banana. <laughs> I, I love that that's just... Oh, this a book has a lot of like really fun little just small details that mm-hmm. don't really matter they don't really <laughs> add up to anything that's just like a side note and it's like oh that's ridiculous uh, yeah I, th- I thought it was fleshes too, out the world <laughs> yeah too ridiculous to just pass up like <laughs> talking about how insane of a death that is that's how he ascends to the throne well, it was cool too because that if that had not happened that lady intended to go on for a long long time which roland was fine with and flag yeah. was not that um, it actually kind of informs us of roland's character even though it has nothing to do with him the fact that he ascended to the throne through this goofy happenstance yeah. kind of shows you it, it uh, reflects his just friendly uselessness <laughs> as a kid. <laughs> Which, and I also, I think it, uh, jumping ahead a little bit, it is a great uh, parallel to Thomas becoming king because neither one of them were prepared for it. Mm-hmm. And... Thomas is his father's son. Like they talk about Mm -hmm. how similar they are. So I thought that was an interesting parallel. They both just woke up one day finding out they were going to be king 
and then had to deal with it. So King Roland, uh, they call him King Roland the Good uh, because he is he's just good. He's like, he's an all right king. Mm -hmm. No, you know, he the people love him. But he's also like not going to go down in history as any doing anything great. Yeah, thinking hurts is what you. Yes. Said. Uh, yeah, well, I think that's... <laughs> I forgot about the, the pain. That, like thinking it's gives like him a headache. It's like boulders rolling around in yeah. his head. <laughs> there, there's a line at some point in the book that I, I'm going to paraphrase because I don't ri- remember it right out. But it's something along the lines of a great king is loved. A good king is tolerated. <laughs> and that is, he's, that is yeah, Roland. He's yeah. Roland the tolerable. Everyone's like, oh yeah, this guy, okay, sure. Yeah, he sure. tries. Oh yeah, we he have a king. He tries his best. <laughs> <laughs> well, Flag knows that he can control Roland, that he can just whisper in his ear and things will go the way he wants to. However, the kingdom does start getting nervous because he's, in his 50s and still has not married and he has not had any children. Flag, being his closest advisor, knows that Roland is not interested in women. I like how progressive this book is. It's, I thought this, Roland is the only asexual character I can think of in maybe any book I've read, uh, let alone King. Yeah. Because yeah. I, I don't, that. I didn't get the sense that he was gay. He no, was just like, either. just not interested in he's that just part like, of life. Nah, not a thing that I yeah. think about, which I thought was like, oh, I kind of like this guy. Yeah. <laughs> if it doesn't have to do with hunting, Roland's just not interested. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so Flag gets all of these prospective wives together and he meets them and he finally chooses his wife, Sasha, who, as we find out, oh, he married Sasha. And then the next sentence, which she will die giving birth to their second son. <laughs> They marry, Sasha is 17 at this time, and again, Roland is 50. But it's Mm. medieval time, it it happens. Now, I had to write this quote down, because I just, well, I wanted to see CM's face when I read it. Uh, When they talk about uh, conceiving Peter, he says, (laughs) he put the king's iron into the forge of the Western barony. (laughs) Bet. Like a raw cob of corn through butter. <laughs> just the the innuendo in this book is just dynamite. <laughs> Before we talk about the the conception of both of the princes, uh, can we talk about the the queen and their relationship? And between Sasha and Flag, yeah, and because he he wanted the king. I think there were like three women that he could choose from. Yep. And he just wanted someone simple that wouldn't get in his way. And so he's like, yeah, Sasha, whatever, marry her, because he totally underestimated her. And she was just beloved by the entire kingdom. Even Roland loved her and tried to do right by her whenever he could. I, Despite the fact that he's 50 and she's 17, yeah. which is super gross. Very. Um, their relationship is actually, I thought, was kind of sweet. Because she seemed like such a good, genuinely good person, and his love for her was so real. Even though it's not your your sort of normal, quote unquote, or typical romantic love, yeah. it was like this pure love that made him a better king. Exactly. And I, I loved reading about yeah. that, um, which is all the more tragic of... Uh, how she dies, yeah. which is really Ooh. terrible. Yeah. Uh, before we get to our queen's death, let's talk about the hunt. The hunt that is pretty much where we get the the title of this book from eventually. Roland goes out on a hunt and he has to face a dragon. It's like a baby dragon. It's still, still a dragon to contend with, but... He's out hunting and this dragon comes from out of nowhere and everybody in his hunting party freaks out, but not Roland. Roland draws his arrow faux hammer, lets one arrow loose. It flies straight into the air hole in the neck of the dragon. He smogs it good. (laughs) (laughs) Smogs it good. Kills the dragon in one shot, cuts out the nine chambered heart. And he eats it raw, and he thinks it's delicious. That is hard. That is Metal as hell. <laughs> uh, yeah. 
And also that leads um, to not only him having this dragon's head mounted in his den, basically, in his king's chambers, it leads directly to the conception of his first son, Peter. Which is interesting because it, it talks about how, you know, he's not interested in the act of conceiving a child. Mm-hmm. And as much as they've been trying, Flag has been feeding him these potions, these boner potions to try and conceive, <laughs> boner potions. Uh, to conceive a son, and it hasn't worked. But this night after the uh, the hunt, he's so excited, he goes to Sasha and is just like a little kid. He's so excited and proud of himself, and he's telling her about this, this hunt, and she's so proud of him, and it's really sweet. And then they they bone and uh, <laughs> conceive Peter out of this moment of pure love, which mm-hmm. informs Peter's character. I feel like we get the most just starting out in this first part of Peter through his memory of Sasha, mm-hmm. the lessons that she gave to him before she died. And one, like the most important one that he has carried with him was when he was at a great feast with his father and everybody. And of course, mothers could not sit with their children. And so she had prepped him beforehand, like, okay, this is all the etiquette you need to know. This is what you do. And just made sure he was well behaved at the dinner. And so at the end, she was complimenting him on everything he did. But there's one thing, one problem, and that was that he did not use his napkin. And he was like, but mom, neither did the king or you know anybody else and so she goes into this long just this really great lesson actually about you know the difference between like kings and dogs and when you become a king you get larger you like you grow invisibly and it's easy to squash little people and you have to be very careful and like so careful that you can't forget about things like remembering your napkin which he he never does again it became it becomes um Seemingly a very important plot point uh, near the end of this section that Peter will not eat without a napkin. And in fact, on the few occasions where like his butler forgets to bring him a napkin once and it's the closest he comes to ever being visibly angry. Mm -hmm. He he tells him off and says, never forget my napkin ever again. And the other cool part that we get about Peter is, is this is after Sasha dies. She had this dollhouse and he's playing with it and through playing with it and imagining he's keeping her spirit and her lessons alive, which causes a huge problem for flag and ultimately ends up being the one time, at least that we're told of that Roland really shows like a backbone and he thinks very hard and long about it and decides, no, he's, you know, he's having fun and he's having such fun and feels so close to his mother in those moments that Roland wants to join him and play too. And it's, that's a beautiful moment that kind of brings him and his dad closer together. And I mean, there, there's no dancing around it. Peter is the favorite child. Yes. He, and I think part of it is uh, not only because he has, uh, he's gifted physically and naturally, but he also reminds Roland so much of, the queen like he looks like her he's smart like she is and i think that's part of the reason he loves peter so much more is it's all those great qualities he loved in his wife now thomas is a little bit of a different story thomas uh was conceived four years later the potions that ben alluded to flag decided he was going to make it a little stronger than normal And it caused uh, Roland to actually hurt his wife while they were making love. And so he is he is like conceived in a more artificial and and painful kind of way. And it is with giving birth to Thomas that Sasha dies. And it says the only people who know what really happened, the true circumstances were Flag and Anna Crook. Crook Brows. Yes, Anna Crook Brows, the mid- who was the she midwife. She needed to pluck. <laughs> and it's it simply says Flag's patience for Sasha had run out. And he tried to poison her once before then, but then and I can't remember why, but he he backed down. Oh, I think it was because the king loves her so much that he knew that if it there was 
any hint of foul play that the king would follow that to the ends of the earth. And mm-hmm. if that led to Flag's door, Flag was in trouble. I, wow. What actually happened to her with this midwife is so tragic. And I, it's horrible, but I feel so bad for the midwife too. What did you guys think well, of tell that? Us, tell us, uh, everybody, yeah. what happened. So years ago, the midwife had a son who had some fever or illness. He was going to die. He was very sick. And everybody in this kingdom knows about Flag, and they all fear him. But they also know that he does have potions, and he can be a healer. So she goes to him, and he has her bring her son one dark, stormy night. I don't know if it's actually dark or stormy, but it is. <laughs> Feels right. Yeah. Yeah. And he gives him this potion and it cures him. And he says, in return, I'm going to need a favor from you. And you will fulfill that favor. And he threatens her. And I can't quite remember the words he uses, but he's basically like, you would do anything for your son, right? You better make good on this promise when the time comes. So the time comes. Sasha's going into labor and he whispers in Anna's ear. And as the baby is coming out, Anna pulls out her knife she makes a cut and basically Sasha bleeds to death and it nobody knows because it just looks like it was a rough pregnancy yeah it it shows the level of slyness that flag has the uh how good he is at manipulating people to get what he wants um it's so fucking evil Because he waited a long time for that promise. Yeah. And killing someone in such an awful way through someone else Mm -hmm. is somehow even worse. Yeah. But we also know that Flag is fully into the idea of collecting favors, collecting people, because that is the game he plays. And we, we get the... Uh, the kind of some backstory that Flag has come to this kingdom to sow the seeds of chaos tons of times, and just no one remembers he was uh, he was here two hundred years ago as Bill Hinch, Lord High Executioner, four hundred years ago as a singer named Abrausto who started a war. He has time, so he is more than eager to get an IOU from someone and he has the power to give you almost anything you want so he can ask for incredible favors it's what makes him so dangerous and something else that is not great for peter is that flag is scared of peter he knows that he even king roland at one point it just says he knows that flag rules the kingdom in everything but name Mm -hmm. but flag knows that Peter is going to be like his mother. And he won't need him. No. They, uh, I believe that it's around this point where it says, they talk about how the whole kingdom loves Peter the, the way they loved Sasha. There's a throwaway line that they, the people of the kingdom say, Peter is going to bring the white. It gave me goosebumps. <laughs> uh, for anyone who is not a, uh, hasn't read the dark tower series yet there are so many small connections um and i want to talk to you guys about that um obviously the most obvious one king roland interesting that they would name uh he would name the king who's bumbling (laughs) and uh ineffective after the fucking coolest character King has ever created, <laughs> uh, Roland Deschain. Mm-hmm. Do, do you guys think that this kingdom of Delane exists in or will one day become Gilead? I can't tell if I think that it is pre-Gilead or if I think that it's just, you know, another a similar universe. Another level these, of the tower. Yeah, we have, we have these elements, the name Roland, just, I don't know. I have, I'm undecided on that. It's just, I, reading this, can so easily imagine this being, you know, who knows, thousands of years, a millennia before, but will eventually grow mm-hmm. into what will eventually become Midworld. Yeah. Yeah. If, if that is the case, 
what I would not have given for a single throwaway line in the Dark Tower series where the man in black jo- just goes, fucking Rollins. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's just it. <laughs> I'm no. constantly a problem with Rollins. No, I, that, it's entirely possible. I, I think I err on the side of it is a different level of the tower. It is a, it's a mid-world adjacent There are world. other connections, though, because they yeah. talk about uh, how Peter learned the great letters, uh, which is the language mm-hmm. of Gilead, uh, the high language of Gilead. They also talk about the rarity of gunpowder. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And why it's, it should not be used frivolously. Although also they do talk about God instead of Gan. So, I mean, it could go either way. <laughs> yeah. It all depends on where this takes place. Now, uh, a, a character that we get introduced to this point where we finished our reading has not done a lot, but this is where we meet Ben Stad and his father, Andrew Stad, the, uh, the squire. They meet at a what? What is that, a harvest? Harvest days the, or something? The, the farmers' uh, festival, yeah. I think, is what yeah, it's the, called. The most kings don't go to, but Roland loves himself a party, Never so he misses. is there. <laughs> and uh, Peter is in the three-legged race with Ben, and I love that Ben's like, "Oh fuck, I'm with the prince. <laughs> oh, this is going to be the worst." And they go and immediately take off. They. They work in synchronicity, and at the very end, like just before they reach the end, they trip and fall over, and his dad is like, "Oh, me and my kid are gonna get beheaded because the <laughs> the king's gonna his king's son's gonna lose." And Roland is just drunk and laughs and is like, "You guys can do it." Tell them to <laughs> hop like rabbits, yeah. or something. <laughs> <laughs> and they do, and they hop to victory, and they they become like best friends. Uh, do you guys want to talk about uh, Peter saving the horse? Yeah. Just I, another instance of Peter's all around goodness. I think that's like a vital part of who Peter is. This is because up to now, it's been the kids growing up and it's mostly focused around Roland at this mm-hmm. point. But now we get um, Peter is what is he? Ten or like eight or ten. Eight or yeah. Eight, yeah. Nine, ten. And uh, he's walking through the through the castle and sees the the head of the stables about to put down a horse with a broken leg. Uh, He's picking up a big maul to just brain this horse. And Peter's like, whoa, what the hell? (laughs) Don't do that. And they describe how this guy, he's a big gruff fantasy stereotype of like just (laughs) the big gruff stable guy and he's like ah any other kid he would have laughed and told him to fuck off even even being the prince he he would have been like shut up kid go go get whipped for interfering with adult work exactly but peter even at this age speaks with such um Authority. authority And decisiveness that uh, he stops and he's like, well, what do you want me to do? <laughs> and they call in a vet and the vet's like, uh, yeah, put him down because it's a horse with a broken leg. It's going to limp the rest of its life. But Peter says, I will take care of this horse. I will put uh, the medicine on his leg every day and I will work and keep this horse healthy. And he does. Where any other kid, um, I mean, I don't know if you guys had pets as a kid, mm-hmm. uh, but I think every single person in the world could probably uh, relate <laughs> to, I'll take care of it. Come on, I'll walk it every day. And uh, at three least me. Later. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, exactly. Three days later, the horse is like laying in a in a ditch somewhere and the kid's like, I found a hoop and stick. I'm going to play with this instead. But no, Peter keeps his word and takes care of this horse. All the more tragic when we have sort of the counterpoint to that with Thomas. He and this doesn't happen at the same time. It's afterwards. But he comes across a dog that's injured and he's he's upset. And I can't remember what exactly happened right before that. I think his dad hurt his feelings. It's the boat. boat. Oh, the boat. Okay, so Thomas sees 
how good Peter is at things and how much love that has earned him with his father. And he's a little boy. He wants to be loved too. And he decides that even though he's not as good as Peter at these things, he's going to carve his father a wooden sailboat because he had this great memory of going to the lake with him once and his father, it was just him and Thomas and they had sailboats and it was beautiful and amazing. And he wanted his love so badly that he painstakingly carves this lumpy sailboat. <laughs> it's so sad. It uh, is so sad. But he tried so hard. He And it still sucks. <laughs> so he presents it to Roland and Flag is with him. And Flag is very keen and he kind of sees, you know, where where he can make things go his way in this interaction. But he presents it to him and Roland like barely gives it a glance before he's talking about how Peter won the archery tournament or something. Mm. And uh, Thomas is actually better at at archery yeah. and has, has done better. But all he can talk about is Peter. And then Thomas goes away and Roland's voice carries out to him as he's telling Flag that it looks like a turd. <sighs> because Thomas see, or uh, Roland sees it and thinks, this is something I would do. Mm. Like the poor kid, he's a fuck up. Like me. Yeah. And it comes from a good place, I think. Because he, he it's feels... thoughtless, though. He, well, yeah. yeah. Saying it out loud was not great. <laughs> but, like, he, he feels for his son. And you feel that there is love there. Yeah. But he's an idiot. So he doesn't yeah. show it right. And so then Thomas sees this injured dog. And he even thinks to himself, I could nurse this dog back to health like Peter and his pony. And instead, he stones it to death. It's a real Harold moment. Apt pupil moment. Yeah, but Thomas isn't a bad kid, right? Right? Well, not a bad kid, right? The the narrator (laughs) isn't (laughs) saying. That's that's the note, because it's a page before that. It's like, Thomas wasn't a bad boy. It's it's not saying that he isn't a bad kid. (laughs) Obviously, that's shitty. Hold on. But School social worker, there are no bad kids. Kids sometimes make bad choices. Exactly. That's what it's saying. Is All like right. He is a victim of his circumstances. Let's get into uh, Flag's master plan, because he has decided Peter has to go, but he can't kill Peter, because Peter's so beloved. It's the same problem he had with the queen. Something else has to be done, because it will all, they'll follow every trail all the way back. So Flag has virtually every poison in existence in his lab, and he has a very special poison. It is triple locked. It is locked in a desk drawer, then inside a living lock, a cleffa, cleffa carrot? That he waters and it would scream if someone tried to open it. Which is so cool. Yeah, that is <laughs> such a bizarre, that's another one of those like really weird, almost sci-fi like <laughs> ideas. I don't want anything I, to scream when I water it. <laughs> I, I, I love that thing. And inside that is another box. And inside that box is an enchanted packet of dragon sand. Dragon sand is one of the most horrifying poisons in existence. And to the point where Flag, when he is preparing his plan, holds his breath and works. He runs out into the hallway and breathes through the window and then holds his breath the entire time he works with it because he's scared for even a grain of this stuff to be inhaled. And we will find out pretty soon why that is. Dragon sand. First, I want to talk about, because this is another thing that makes me think that this story is very close to Midworld. Because this dragon sand, he describes where it came from. In this story, there's this, whatever continent that this kingdom exists on, there is uh, another continent that, of course, I didn't write down what it's called. (laughs) But it's uh, very similar to the two continents in... in, uh, uh, Song of Ice and Fire. Yeah. Where the main story takes place. And then there's this other other place that's very far away, but it is exotic. Magic exists there. Uh, this is where Flag came from. Uh, quote unquote, came <laughs> from. Um, but the place that this dragon sand came from is beyond even that. Nope. No one in this kingdom except for Flag even knows that this place exists. 
and it is described as this green fallow place where there are the entire deserts of this stuff that even inhaling the air around it can kill you instantly. And that to me sounds exactly like a place where the world has moved on Mm -hmm. where one of the places in mid world where it is a possibly nuclear, uh, fallout site where something so terrible happened here that it is uninhabitable. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Now flag puts this sand and mixes it in wine, takes it to Roland and, This is all we get of this part of the story. We'll get back to it, but we get this snippet because Flag uses his ability to become dim. And he can't become invisible because invisibility is impossible. But he can become dim. Yes, that's (laughs) such a neat detail. (laughs) That night, he'd made himself dim to deliver this wine, but Thomas saw him leave the room. Thomas knows that Flag was in his father's room this night because he was seeing it through the eyes of Niner, the dragon, the head that is on the wall and flag himself is the one who showed him that there was this secret passage. Sam, do you want to talk about the, uh, the secret passage? Yeah. So flag often says in this book that he just has like this knack for being mischievous he he takes things sometimes just because like this inner voice tells him it would be a good idea and it always pays off later and one of those things is showing thomas this hidden passageway so he's over the years been befriending him and is actually maybe kind of like the flag we're more familiar with when he's talking to tommy you know his <laughs> good friend tommy yeah and so he tells him you know i'm going to show you something and it's going to be amazing I'm paraphrasing. And so he takes him down this corridor and tells him to press this brick that's like the third or fourth one up. And he does. And this the wall opens. And so they go in and he pulls back these slats in the wall and he tells him to look through. And it's his father's sitting room. So he here can spy on his father. Through Drum roll. The, the eyes, eyes of, of the, the dragon. dragon. Did anybody else go, yay? <laughs> yeah. When it's just like in the movies, when they say the name <laughs> yeah. of the movie, yep. I just smile every time. I did. I out loud did the CinemaSins roll credits <laughs> as that thing happened. Uh, but Thomas spies on his father a lot. This chaos that he wanted to sow it really works because thomas becomes obsessed with sneaking in and watching his father he watches uh as peter decides to bring his father a glass of wine every night and and that he, he tried to get thomas to go in on he did and he even pays for it despite the fact that their family owns it but he pays he bought the wine and he takes it to his dad just as a gesture and he will sit and look through these eyes and watch it but he also finds out that after Peter leaves, his dad just gets hammered, just drinks beer all night. And sometimes he gets aggressive. There's a night where he walks around screaming at all of the heads on the walls and he looks at the dragon head and starts yelling at it. And Thomas freezes in fear because he like, thinks that he's looking at Starts him. yelling like, why are you looking at me? Yeah. While looking mm-hmm. into the eyes of the dragon, basically directly into Thomas's eyes. Which, Which comes see. back in a sad way. Yes. Yeah. The the thing that I think is interesting is that I feel like Peter, or I feel like Thomas thought the more he, that using this was a way he would kind of get closer mm-hmm. to his father. He'd mm-hmm. know more about him, but it ends up having the opposite effect. It He says it fills him with contempt because he's seen what his father is like without the societal mask on who he really is and who he really is disgusts him. I mean, that's how I am when I'm in my house alone. (laughs) (laughs) I've talked to your husband. I'm aware. (laughs) Uh, It's, it's just so interesting. Like that. I think that that's a kind of off topic, but there, you know, when they, people have that discussion of uh, if you ask people, if they could have a superpower, if they could fly or be invisible, if you ask people, 
in front of people, they'll probably say fly because people are embarrassed are embarrassed to say they'd be invisible because there's a lot of creepy connotations of being invisible. <laughs> but if you ask them anonymously, a lot of people will say they'd be invisible. See, I always just say I would watch people go to the bathroom. <laughs> and you can do that with flight or invisibility. I just cut right to the chase. Yeah. I don't even pick one. I just say, oh yeah, my, I would watch people go to the bathroom. But I'll cut that. <laughs> it also ties me to a note that I made when I talked about uh, Flag being the king's wizard. My autocorrect made it uh, kink. So uh, my note says Flag is the kink wizard. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, so Thomas... Uh, we we go back to the night that uh, Flag brings Roland this this glass after this routine of Peter bringing him glass night after night. Everybody knows that this is what happens. He comes in late one night after that, and Roland lets him in. And at first, Thomas can't see Flag. He's, his dad's just talking to no one. That is so cool. That is so awesome. Speaking uh, of superpowers, I, I would totally choose to be able to go dim that is yeah. such a cool ability it is i would really fly great. <laughs> seriously <laughs> to watch people go to the bathroom yeah, right. and airplanes <laughs> yeah i get it um but uh, i think roland says flag's name and then all of a sudden thomas is like oh flag is there why uh, of course he's standing right there it just doesn't register he sees them toast and flag toasts to peter to the king and thomas thinks that's two separate toasts, but mm-hmm. it's not. They, uh, Thomas can feels like something is wrong. He's watching something bad happen, but he can't figure out what it is. He just can't put his finger on it. And that night he falls ill. And by the time he feels better, it says that Roland is dead and Peter's been locked away for life. Thomas becomes... King Thomas the Lightbringer at age 12. Now, uh, uh, th- there's another uh, Dark Tower-ish name drop. I wrote it down because I, it sounded familiar, but I couldn't place it. Maybe you guys can help me. Uh, Flag mentions Rhiannon, the Dark Witch of the Coos. Book four. The witches, yeah. In, uh, n- oh, not Cala Brinster. Wizard of Glass. Glass. Uh, yeah, I was trying to think of the oh, Kala. Susan Delgado. Um, yeah, the yeah. Kala, Kala something. Anyway, yeah, in uh, Kala, in Kala, Kala Chameleon, yeah, uh, in uh, book yep. four, Wizard and Glass, there's mm. uh, Rhea of the Coos. Rhea, that I knew that sounded familiar and I could not place mm-hmm. it. Do we in do we learn about the the witches of the Coos very not, much, or is that just that's uh, it's just a thing that it's a title, I guess, or a place where witches come from? I, guess. I don't know, it's not too late, Mr. King. <laughs> All right, now let's talk about Flag's frame job. Flag frames Peter. When Peter was little, his mother gave him an engraved box. And it was one of those moments, Peter steps away from the table for a moment, and Flag sees it there, and he doesn't know why, but he picks it up and puts it in his robes. And so years have passed, and he's just had this box. Well, now this box has a purpose. He knows that in Peter's quarters... There is a secret shelf on his bookshelf that's secret as in like a kid made it. So everybody knows it's there. Even his uh, butler accidentally found it once. And he keeps, you know, childish things in there. And then it turns into a lock of hair from his lady friend and letters that they've written to each other. And so Flag gets into his like triple locked, crazy, poisonous (laughs) (laughs) dragon sandbox and he takes, he takes a couple grains, and he enchants a mouse, poor mouse, <laughs> and he puts it in a little bit of mead and honey, and he makes the mouse drink it. And there's a little bit of paper in there, and so he puts all of this with Peter's engraved box into that cubby hole. And then he lets chaos ensue, and has. it's interesting the way he has to rely on so many things just kind of lining up when they could have easily gone the other way for his plan to to go off without a hitch, which it does. It's timed perfectly because he has to, he sets this in Peter's room before the king even dies. But it's on like the third. I think it takes him three days to die. Yes, mm-hmm. uh, which is a horrible the, death. Oh yeah, the, we didn't. We haven't God, talked about that. Let's talk let's about do that it. Um, because it happens 
in the middle of a crowded ballroom. Yeah. Um, for the days after um, the king drinks this mead, he feels great. It is, which is another really interesting side effect of this poison, this dragon sand, is it revitalizes you for several days. His hair starts, it, it, where it was white, it starts gaining back the the steel color, and he starts being decisive and strong to where the point where people in the kingdom are like, wow, have you seen the king? <laughs> And then in the middle of this ball, he bursts into flames <laughs> from the inside out. Ugh. More than that, he is starts pouring fire from his mouth and nostrils and the corners of his eyes. Just it yeah, is, steam just pouring out of him. They bring him into his bed and it's not immediate. They bring him to his bedroom where he lays and he smolders so hot that they keep having to dump buckets of water on him to keep his clothes from catching on fire. And they can't come within like four feet of yeah. him because the air is burning. Yeah. It basically he held on. turns yeah, him did. into an oven. I would have died from that immediately. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, you would hope. <laughs> I God. Know, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's this unspeakably awful way to die. And uh, at his bedside, after he finally passes, there's silence and Flag is there looking over everything, and the the doctors and um, servants, and in this silence, one person speaks out, murder, and Flag immediately is like, oh, here we go. He was like, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. He like wanted to fist pump, but he like, ah, oh, can't do it. Can't yeah, celebrate. he keeps, throughout this section of the book, he keeps like, just covering his mouth so he can smile. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> come on, man. Just trying to look concerned, but he's like trying not to giggle. Flag, you're a professional. Yeah. <laughs> Get it together. So Flag takes charge. He immediately orders a search for evidence, but he specifically says the prince's rooms are off limits because he's putting that forward. Like, There's no way it could be the prince's. However, the next day, the butler's, uh, Peter has a butler, and that butler's son is being trained to be Peter's butler. Uh, his name is Dennis. Dennis is going about his chores, and all of a sudden, smoke comes pouring from the bookshelf. So Dennis runs over to it. He finds the secret door, which he knew about, but he sees the smoke coming from. Uh, he opens the door, puts out the fire, and takes the body of the the mouse that had, that was dying, that finally died, it, like it's super hot. He can barely touch it. He grabs it and he drops it into a bucket of ash and goes home <laughs> immediately knows that there's something and, and on his way carrying it home. He is the first to suspect Peter of killing the king. And this isn't a bad kid either. Like his family no. has for generations been butlers and they're really well regarded in the kingdom and respected and trusted and it's just sad so now dennis shows his father this mouse and they decide that they're going to take it to the judge general pena and pena knows that they, they know that he will act with swift justice they take it to to pena and they show him the rat and they talk about how it died and how it uh, where he found it. And so then they search Peter's room and they find the the smoldering remains of the box that has Peter's name on it. They have all this evidence now. And Pena calls the only reliable source, Flag, to come and look at this evidence. First, even though he hates him. Even yes. though he hates him. Uh, that's, uh, I feel like before we go on, we should have a quick word about who Pena is, because I think he's a really cool character. Uh, he is the head judge. What's his actual title? Uh, judge, General. judge General. Judge General of the kingdom. And he is described as, besides the king, the most powerful person in the kingdom. He is, uh, while the king is basically God, he's infallible. Pena is law he is yeah. the keeper of the earthly laws of the kingdom and he's strong and he's honorable and he's trustworthy he's the anti-flag mm -hmm. and flag fucking hates him 
and he does not trust him because he knows if it was up to Pena, he would be exiled. Because he's made it very clear that he doesn't trust him or like him. Yes. Which is a part of Pena's major flaw is his pride. His pride and in, in self-esteem that he will always do what's best. He then treats every decision he makes and every judgment he has as though that is the best and doesn't second guess it. Mm-hmm. When they are, uh, Peter was up all night helping with the search for evidence. And when Pena comes to him and I'm trying to remember what, what does he, is it that he tells him that his father's dead or that he tells him, um, I don't remember what news, the news, the specific news he gives to Peter. I think that they s- suspect him. Yeah. Because he oh, knows his yeah, father's okay. dead. Yes. Uh, Peter cries. And as soon as he cries, Pena says uh, in his head, oh, he's guilty. He yeah, definitely did Because it. if like a true king would have yelled at him, he'd have been like, this is ridiculous and mm-hmm. not really shown emotion because he's king and he's, you know, above everything. But that Peter showed emotion, he took that to mean guilt. Yeah. yeah. How dare he love his father and be up all night tearing the castle apart looking and for evidence. And, and emotional. exhausted and emotional. <laughs> yeah. Like, how dare he? So they call a, a, a meeting. They keep saying it's just a, a meeting. Very informal. And it is. Pena. But the narrator doesn't agree. <laughs> yes. Which I think is really cool. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's Pena, Flag, Peter, and four of the judges. They have seven, I believe. They, uh, they're not ju- They're the high lawyers yes, or whatever. The high, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the court lawyers. Yes. <laughs> uh, and Pena basically says, you're the king now. And I can't arrest you for murder because you're the king. But if you are innocent, people still are going to think you are a murderer. So if you become king and there's no trial, people will always think that. And there will be civil war in days. Yeah, See, it will and this hurt is the where I'd have been like, no, dude, I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, he said, but he keeps reiterating, you don't have to do this, but this is what's going to happen. And Peter, wanting to be the best king possible, mm-hmm. says, yeah. Okay, I will uh, hold off taking the throne, uh, the throne and the crown, until we have a trial. But one of the lawyers has to be the final judge because you've already decided that I'm guilty. Fucking calls him out mm-hmm. right away, which is very kingly. It's everything Peter does is so regal and so he's just naturally mm-hmm. a leader, and you can. Everyone that uh, later on, like once, spoiler, uh, he's been tried, anyone he interacts with, the first thing they think is like, oh. This is a king. This guy isn't acting like a murderer. He's acting like a king. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is really cool. The thing that I find really interesting is the moment Peter realizes he's going to be found guilty. And that is when he has brought his dinner in his room because that's where he is being held until the trial. And the guard spits in his food. And at that moment, he knows he's going to be found guilty because everyone wants to believe it. Mm -hmm. It's a sensational story and they want it to be true regardless of the facts. Uh, I found it really interesting. They say he's thinking about this and he says uh, something along, along the lines of people want a good king. But more than that, they want to think they just narrowly avoided a bad yes. mm-hmm. and Which I get. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, more than just letting Peter, who will obviously be mm-hmm. a very good king, they'd rather throw that out just so they have this sensation. Yeah. Now, Flag, neck, now that he's found guilty, he's sentenced to life at the in the cell at the top of the needle because no member of the royal family can be sentenced to death so he's life in prison and this has all been passed down uh thomas is starting to finally become healthy flag goes to him and oh my gosh just a moment <laughs> of genius goes to thomas and is like you're going to be king Good luck. I'm on my way. And he's such a little boy. It's just, so, yeah, he's so 12 mean. years old. 12. And yeah, I just love that he's like, well, uh, good luck. 
Uh, I know you'll do great, buddy. Have a good one. And Puts on a traveling leave. cloak and a, mm-hmm. like a cane. Because he knows it's important that Thomas, like he does not want to tell Thomas, you need me. He wants to get him to tell, for Thomas to tell Flag, I need you. And he yeah. does. And he does. Tricking a little boy. Yeah, he does. Now, uh, one more thing about Thomas. Uh, let's talk about the coronation when, when Thomas gets the crown. He, he has so much anxiety. Flag gives him... Uh, a potion to calm him down. Pepto-bismol. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so he doesn't shit himself on the stand when he gets his crown. And people say that, and he says that they say it for years, that this child leans on Flag like he is an elderly man and needs Flag's help to walk. Because he makes him, he says, take my arm so I don't mm-hmm. trip because he's so nervous. And then that is just how the people always see him. Yeah. A frail child on Flag's arm. And... Uh, again, I, Thomas isn't a bad kid, yet when he's standing there and people are cheering for him, he hopes that Peter can hear these cheers for him. And he gets pleasure thinking that Peter is sitting there listening. I would argue that he has no concept, really, of what Peter is experiencing. And if he did, he would he would have felt differently. It, it's just this abstract thing like, oh, Peter's up there, you know, 300 steps up in this tower. He's He's not thinking about the tragedy of this imprisonment and he's it's a product of his lifelong manipulation by flag because uh it tells a story of how uh years before when thomas was still very small flag took him down into the treasury to show him piles of gold and jewels and how Flag said, oh, yeah, one day this will all be your brother's. <laughs> yeah. And Thomas said, oh, and mine. And Flag was like, oh, no, you don't get anything. <laughs> like, Which isn't even <laughs> true. Yeah. But it, it's all t- Flag for years has been manipulating this kid to be um, uh, selfish and cowardly. Uh, it's actually one of my favorite parts of the book is there's this awesome metaphor where uh flag is saying that thomas uh each person their mind is like a well a deep well with yeah. steer uh um still clean clear waters uh but sometimes someone will see something so awful that uh they'll say no i don't want to deal with this and they'll throw it down the well and if after long enough enough of these terrible things are thrown into the well it will become poisoned and that is what we call insanity and i'm like that's <laughs> that awesome was amazing uh and yeah it's this is thomas is be poisoned mm-hmm. but and he is also and because he's so overwhelmed by this position he is in denial of the fact that he knows that flag he puts it together mm-hmm. that flag did it but his rational brain will not accept that that is possible because then that means a- everything is wrong and his brother should be king and it he, his brain can't handle that truth and he continues to have nightmares about that moment when mm-hmm. his father is yelling and he's staring into the dragon's eye and he thinks that he sees him but in the dream his father is saying how could you let your brother go to prison you know what happened yeah you got it wrong so and then burst into flames yeah. before his eyes. now let's get to what peter does with his life sentence so cool <laughs> peter doesn't eat or drink anything for seven days and the guards themselves are like oh he's just gonna let himself waste away because he's guilty and that will save us the trouble of having to take care of him but on the eighth day he calls for aaron beeson who is the 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 head of the the guards and brings him into the room and he gives him instructions like a king. Beeson is furious that he is being spoken to by a prisoner. Like, how dare Peter make a single request of him and decides to teach him a lesson. He has like a, a metal rod in his hand to weight his yeah. fist. Uh, a medieval roll of quarters. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And it goes to kick Peter's ass because oh, this kid hasn't eaten or drank for a week. In a week. And Peter kicks the shit out of him. And it's awesome. Without breaking a sweat. Yeah. Uh, this guy charges at him and he just lithely steps out of the way. 
uh, he disarms him. Peter gets this metal rod and punches him three times and breaks the guy's jaw. And he's because he's been trained in boxing. Mm-hmm. He does get his face cut though. He has a scar, yes, close to his from eye, his, all the way down his from face. From Beeson's nail, he has a sharp Ugh, nail and God. it slashes his cheek open. So uh, after he kicks the shit out of him, and the gu- the other guards are, like watching through the door. And, like, yeah, they won't come in. They won't come like, in. <laughs> no, I'm not going to get my ass kicked. Yeah. Beeson wakes up and realizes, oh, you, why didn't you just kill me? And he says, that's not that. How is that efficient? Oh, Peter's response is so awesome. He tells him, I've never killed anyone yes. mm-hmm. before. Why would I start with an unconscious jailer? <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So good. Uh, and all he says, he needs a letter delivered to Pena. He he will handle whatever bribe needs to happen because he has very simple requests. His requests are that his meals be served with a royal napkin. They can remove the crest if they want, but he wants a royal napkin and he wants his mother's dollhouse. And that gives Pena a like this glimmer of hope and doubt and that doubt that he he immediately squishes down squishes down whatever <laughs> because <laughs> because that means that his judgment was wrong that he judged a man for crying mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and that I thought that was interesting the way he he was impressed because Peter was very blunt and to the point I did not murder my father mm-hmm. and it I don't know I'm like really excited to see. Even though I've read it. I've, yeah. I was just about to ask, because I read this. Um, I actually discovered, I was trying to remember when I read this, and this was my second King book. Whoa. Nice. Uh, which is funny that The Stand was my first. <laughs> um, uh, so I don't remember the end of this book. I don't remember most of this book. I do not either. I just remember it's always been extremely, like, I'm just so fond of this story, the way it's told. Knowing that that none of us know what is going to happen, (laughs) Um, we know Peter has a plan to escape, Mm -hmm. and it has to do with his mother's dollhouse. Yes, and napkins. Okay, I I have two thoughts. Remember that, so I'm not going to (laughs) say. Oh, okay. I I don't at all. Uh, Josh, the one person who has, what do you think his plan is? Is he going to Rapunzel his way out of the tower? <laughs> that like makes like, as much sense as anything. Oh, we didn't talk sturdy about, napkins. We didn't talk about what's in the dollhouse, which well, it's, it's like a fully functional yeah, dollhouse. It, is yes. exact, it has yeah. a stove, a loom, like real uh, floors. A working water pump. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah it's, a, it's the best dollhouse in the history of dollhouses. And my second thought is anybody get a real Andy feeling from, uh, <laughs> from yeah. Peter? Yep. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm very very excited to to figure to find out what happens at the end of this book. That's it for this episode of Dairy Public Radio. As always, thank you for listening. Join us next episode for part two, covering chapter sixty five through the end of the book. For Joshua Khan and Benjamin Graham, I'm C M Alexander. Reminding you, guilt and secrets like murdered bones never rest easy, but the knowledge of all three can be lived with. <laughs> Hey everyone, Sam Alexander here. Thank you for listening to part one of The Eyes of the Dragon. We hope you enjoyed it and that you will join us for part two. I'm going to keep it short and simple today. Follow us on social media at Dairy Public Radio. Email us at dairypublicradio at gmail.com. Check out our website, constantreaders.org. We are always looking for new submissions. And if you get a chance, Check out our Patreon page. We have lots of cool merch there, and we just released our first bonus episode of the club, so you can get extra content as well. That's all for now, listeners. Goodbye.